Thanks everyone for joining us today. We are going to learn a little bit more about heart failure, what exactly it is and what are the treatment options for patients diagnosed with heart failure. So this is the content of my uh, talk today. So we are going to define the condition called heart failure, how common it is in our current um, society, what are the causes of heart failure and how we as cardiologists diagnose and treat heart failure. And most important of all for patients who have heart failure, uh, what are the outlooks for them and for patients without heart failure, how do we prevent heart failure? So what is heart failure? That is the basis of everything that we need to talk about today. So heart failure is a condition where the heart is unable to perform its function of circulating heart around the body in a, in a sufficient manner. So the heart, if we think about it, is a muscular pump. Its uh, primary function is to circulate blood to all the active organs in our body to meet its metabolic needs. So if, in a patient with heart failure, this process is uh, impaired, there is not enough circulation and patients eventually will develop symptoms of heart failure. Heart failure is a clinical syndrome, meaning we cannot use a single test, a blood test or a scan to diagnose heart failure. This is not like cancer where we can do a CT scan and we take some uh, cell samples to diagnose cancer. No, heart failure requires more than that. So doctors need to speak to the patients, get their symptom history and perform a very thorough physical examination. With this suspicion of heart failure, then we will need to move on to some specialized investigations to confirm the diagnosis of heart failure. So this is what we mean by a clinical syndrome. There's no one test that can be easily used to diagnose heart failure. So when a patient has heart failure, what are the typical symptoms that the patient can you know, expect to feel? The most common thing that they often tell us would be effort intolerance. What does that mean? So effort intolerance means a worsening of his exercise capacity, exercise capability. Many of my patients tell me that they used to be able to walk two, three bus stops without any major issues. After their onset of heart failure, they find it even very difficult to complete half a bus stop. To get to one bus stop, they need to stop two to three times. That is what we mean by effort intolerance. And they can present as breathlessness, commonly breathlessness, or patients can just feel very tired when they walk the distance. Then there is also a very common symptom called atopnea or inability to lie flat. Heart failure patients have very, very sensitive lungs. So when they lie flat, the lung pressure actually increases and they feel extremely, extremely uncomfortable. And some patients describe to me as if they are drowning in their own breaths. So that is what many heart failure patients describe to us. And of course, with the heart being very poor, there's poor circulation to all the major organs, including the intestines. Patients often have loss of appetite. They are very, very um, you know, hungry, but they are not able to eat much. Small amounts of food make them very, very nauseated. So that is a common complaint that we have. Eventually, these patients will develop symptoms, signs of heart failure, meaning they'll see water retention, they'll see fluid in their lungs, they'll see fluid in their legs and their tummy, and in severe cases, they might even have low blood pressure, feel dizzy and faint from that. So these are the kind of um, symptoms that my patients often tell me, but how common is this condition? So from a study done about 5-6 years ago, we find that 4.5% of Singapore's population actually at this point in time is living with heart failure. That is a huge number if you compare to other countries like the US and in Europe, where the population prevalence is about 2%. We are having twice the number of heart failure patients in our population. And this is not a trivial diagnosis. Half of patients after diagnosing heart failure die within half a, uh, die within half a decade, five years. That is worse than many cancers that we know of today. So what are the causes of heart failure? My previous speaker, Dr. Chai, talked a lot about ischemic heart disease. And indeed, ischemic heart disease is one of the major causes of heart failure in our population. We used to lose a lot of patients after heart attack. They die because of inadequate treatment. But with advance, uh, advancement in heart attack treatment, many patients survive heart attack, but the long-term consequence would be that of heart failure. Other causes would be high blood pressure, alcohol intake, and increasingly, we are also seeing the success of our cancer treatment. Patients in the past die from cancer, 
but nowadays they survive cancer because of chemotherapy, but in the long run, the chemotherapy can actually cause heart failure. And lastly, a small group of patients have heart failure running in their family. These are the rarer genetic or DNA causes of heart failure. So consequences of heart failure, of course, when the patient develops heart failure, they get symptomatic. They have recurrent episodes of breathlessness and water retention. And because of that, they keep coming in and out of the hospital. They have poor effort tolerance. They are not able to perform their day-to-day -day work uh, or tasks easily. And they get depressed or they get very, very dejected because of that. Of course, in a patient with very weak heart, there's always a uh, risk of sudden death. They can suddenly collapse because of the heart just stopping uh, you know, unexpectedly. In other patients, without this kind of sudden death situation, they might get worsening heart failure and they have end organ dysfunction. They can go into multi-organ failure and they die prematurely. So how do we diagnose heart failure now that we know it's such a, a serious condition? So as I mentioned, heart failure requires an in-depth history taking and physical examination. The examination findings are usually as such. We can see distended neck veins in patients with heart failure. When we listen to their lungs, we can, see, we can hear lung sounds. We look at their legs for leg swelling and we often detect abdominal water retention. The medical term for that is ascites. Specific in, uh, investigations after we suspect the diagnosis of heart failure would include all this. So not everyone goes through every single uh, investigation. The cardiologist looking after the patient will pick the best investigation for the patient to make the diagnosis of heart failure and potentially treat the underlying problem to improve the heart failure. Common tests will include electrocardiogram, a chest x-ray, echocardiogram, and maybe in some situations, a coronary angiogram. Some specific blood tests are also important for us to help improve the outcome of patients with heart failure. So this is an electrocardiogram, an ECG. This is a normal, completely normal ECG. Compare this to a patient with heart failure. There are some subtle signs on this abnormal ECG that can point to uh, the diagnosis of heart failure to the trained eye. An X-ray is often used to diagnose heart failure. So on your left side is a normal X-ray where we see black colored lung fields. The heart looks pretty small, not too enlarged. If you compare that to the X-ray on the right side, the heart looks big, the lung is not nice and black, there are patchy white things in the lungs, and those are water retention signs in the lungs. So that is a typical X-ray that we see of a patient with heart failure. An echocardiogram is one of the most important tools that we have for the diagnosis and the treatment of heart failure. It's a non-invasive ultrasound examination. There is no uh, X-ray radiation involved and it allows for quantification of this pumping function of the heart. If you look at the um, movie on the right side of the screen, the top two chambers of the heart are called the ventricles. They are responsible for pumping blood to the lungs and to the major organs of the body. They are pumping very well, and in this situation, the ejection fraction or the pumping function of the heart is about 60%. A normal heart pumping function will be in the range of 55 to 65%. So this is an absolutely normal uh, uh, echocardiogram. Of course, when we do an echo, we can also look for other causes of heart failure, such as uh, valve dysfunction. If you look at um, the echocardiogram on the right side again, there are little leaflets that we can see separating the top and the bottom chambers of the heart. Those are heart valves, and if they are dysfunctional, they can lead to heart failure and an echo can tell us uh, this information. Of course, there are some people who are born with abnormally, uh, abnormally thick heart muscles. They can also be the cause of heart failure. Contrast the normal echocardiogram uh, we see here to these two echocardiograms. The one on the left side is some, uh, someone with a very weak heart pumping function. We call it uh, e reduced ejection fraction heart failure. The heart pumping function in this situation would be in the range of 15 to 20 percent. Contrast that to the previous echo from the previous slide where the heart is pumping at about 55 to 60 percent. It's very obvious in this case that with this kind of weak heart, the patient is going to suffer from a lot of symptoms of heart failure. On the right side of the um, screen, we can see an echo that is not exactly normal, but we see that the pumping function of the top two chambers of the heart, they are pretty okay. This is what we call preserved ejection fraction heart failure. 
these two different uh, these two different classes of heart failure are very important for us to identify because the reduced ejection fraction heart failure is the kind of heart failure that we traditionally treat and there are good treatment options for that but for preserved ejection fraction or preserved pump uh, function heart failure this tends to uh, occur in elderly women in patients with kidney disease and up to uh, up to today not many good treatment options are available for this group of patients so of course when we talk about heart failure then what's next what after the diagnosis of heart failure treatment options there are some but the most important thing starts from within so patients diagnosed with heart failure they really need to make a conscientious effort to change their lifestyle they need to modify diet they need to reduce their salt intake and this can reduce the chance of them having symptoms of heart failure smoking cessation is important as with most other heart diseases and of course they need to get active some people after diagnosis of heart failure they feel that they can't do as much as the past they would try to you know not walk around sit around for fear of triggering symptoms that is the wrong mindset if you have heart failure in fact exercise can improve heart function and reduce the chance of getting hospitalized for heart failure symptoms medications remain the mainstay for treatment of heart failure as i alluded to just now patients with low ejection fraction or low pump function heart failure the boxes in blue are the standard treatment nowadays for them so there are four generally four classes of drug useful for the treatment of patients with low ejection fraction heart failure Group 1 and group 2 are, main, uh, are common drugs that we often use for patients with high blood pressure. In this situation, in patients with heart failure, they are not exactly uh, targeting the blood pressure. These medications can improve the pump function and can reduce the chance of patients dying. The third class of medication, the mineral, uh, mineralocorticoid uh, antagonists, they are a kind of hormone blockers which can also help patients reduce uh, fluid retention. And the last class of drug called the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor or SGLT2 inhibitor is a new tool that we have um, over the past couple of years. We find that this group of drugs which used to be diabetes drugs now can be used in heart failure patients with low ejection fraction and they can reduce the chance of hospitalization and can make patients live longer. So the blue boxes are very very important they pre uh, prevent death, they prevent hospitalization for patients with poor pump function. Other adjuncts that we use include the very common water pills. We give patients these water pills to expel ex uh, excess water, improve their symptoms, allow them to lie down to sleep without drowning in their own breath. Oops, sorry about that. The next step for suitable patients, we often send them for evaluation of the coronary, artery, uh, coronary arteries. Most of the time we go direct to a coronary angiogram. As Dr. Chai mentioned just now, coronary angiogram allows us to look at the coronary arteries. In a patient with severe coronary artery blockage, the heart muscles are chronically starved of oxygen and it's not surprising that they get very, very weak because of low blood flow. If we can reverse that, if we can put a stand or if we can do a bypass surgery to improve the blood flow, there is a very good chance that the patients with poor heart function can improve their heart function and that's what we hope for all our patients. However, for some patients, despite medication, despite um, putting in stents or going for bypass surgery, the heart function continues to be bad. So in this group of patients, they are at the risk of suddenly collapsing and dying and we have a useful uh, tool for this uh, group of patients we call them the electronic devices that we can implant inside the heart so this group of um, devices can prevent death by delivering a shock if the heart goes into abnormal rhythm dangerous rhythm and some patients with dyssynchrony or abnormal pumping uh, synchrony of the two heart chambers we can use wires to improve the pumping uh, function of the heart and patients can feel better and there's a chance that the heart function might improve in this group of patients and of course for patients who are yet to develop heart failure we hope never to treat them for heart failure so the primary prevention of heart failure is important since coronary artery disease is one of the main causes of heart failure in Singapore the main um, prevention of heart failure would involve the prevention of coronary artery disease so as I mentioned before, smoking cessation, 
avoid excessive alcohol intake, regular exercise and healthy diet. So if we adhere to a healthy diet recommendation by HSA, um, sorry, uh, HPB, um, that will be very, very helpful for us to adopt in our daily life. And of course, for patients uh, more than 50 years old, even if you're healthy, we should go for regular health screening, looking at cholesterol levels, sugar levels, and blood pressure. So in conclusion, heart failure is an increasingly common, pop, uh, common uh, condition in the Singapore uh, population. 4.5% of the Singapore population is actually living with heart failure. Heart failure is a clinical syndrome that requires close uh, uh, examination by the cardiologist together with uh, specialized uh, investigations to come to the diagnosis of heart failure. And once the diagnosis of heart failure is made, many hospitals have multidisciplinary um, teams taking care of patients with heart failure, going from lifestyle modification, medication treatment, as well as in some situations, device implantation. And of course, as I mentioned uh, last slide, the primary prevention of heart failure, preventing coronary artery disease is very important to prevent downstream complications of heart failure. So I thank you for your time.